All right, uh, so finally I want to have a look at the, um, the energy transfer between these uh, scales a little bit more. So from the uh, inert energy containing range to the inertial subrange to the dissipation range. Um, uh, let me draw this one here one more time, essentially, uh, to, to, to illustrate that. So we'll have here the length scale again. We have here L0, we have here L E I, L D I, and eta I. So over here we have the energy containing range. So if you look back at this uh, mixing layer over here, it's uh, easy to, um, to, to imagine that these large-scale structures that you can find here have the most energy. So where do they get that from? They get it from the mean flow. So you have here a uh, velocity difference. Oops. And uh, if I look, for example, at the velocity, you see that the velocity range here, you have your high speed and low speed over there. A little bit longer, but you see here these large scale structures are being created. And they're being created from this velocity difference. So they're being created from the mean flow. So the, um, the, the energy that is being received from the mean flow, that is a production term. So the, the energy containing the range essentially gets the production P. Production of total kinetic energy. All right, so let's come in here into the large scales. So the larger scales are then passing it on to the lower scales. And these are passing it on furthermore to the smaller scales, smaller scales, smaller scales, smaller scales, and so on. So we call this one here IL. The transfer rate To smaller scales. And sorry, time. T. This is supposed to be your T. Now, unfortunately, in the book from John Pope, uh, um, they, uh, the T here looks very similar to the tau, so be, be careful not to make this uh, uh, the difference. So. Um, Tau is the, the, the time scale, and this one is a, the, the curse of T, the, the transfer rate to smaller scales. And then we have the, the lowest scales, we have the dissipation. Here, is, the energy is dissipated. Dissipation epsilon. So, um, Again, so the energy is produced here, then passed on to the smaller scales until it's being dissipated. So if everything is in equilibrium, uh, that means there's, um, it doesn't change over time, that it means that essentially all of these transfer rates need to be identical. So the transfer rate here is a production term, the transfer rate to the uh, smaller scales, to the small scales, the transfer rate to the smaller scales, and the dissipation need to be all identical. So, in an equilibrium, so the production identical, uh, sorry, the transfer rate T. Uh, of the energy containing range that's defined as the uh, transfer rate of L E I is identical to the transfer rate of L that's an identical to the transfer rate to the dissipation range 
Oops, sorry, that would be I. That's identical to the dissipating one. And this one, again, needs to be identical to the production term. So all of these, this chain needs to be identical in an equilibrium. If it doesn't change over time, the production rate, the transfer to the smaller scales to the inertial sub-range, within the inertial sub-range and to the dissipation range and the dissipation needs to be all identical. If it's not in an equilibrium, that means in some places the energy would be piling up. So it would not be uh, something that uh, would be uh, able to, to withstand. Uh, in, uh, in the steady state. Okay, so with that we can have a look at the energy spectrum. First I'm going to introduce a wave number. K, or kappa, as 2 pi over L. So what does this wave number say? Essentially, you see it goes with the, with the length scale, so the, the higher the, uh, uh, the wave number, the smaller the, 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 or the, the higher the frequency that's associated to it. With that, I can now define the energy contained in, within a wave number range. integral from Ka to Kb, the energy of K to K. Okay, and then I can plot uh, my energy spectrum. So here's my energy. Here's my wave number. And now I can plot the curve. Let's get to the next one. I need to be very accurate. Right. Then it somewhat looks like this. If we have here a log log scale. So it means this axis is logarithmic and this axis is logarithmic. Okay, I can here again identify my three ranges. So I have here the energy containing range. So these are the, the low frequencies, essentially. I have here the dissipation range. And in between I have the inertial sub range. <clears throat> so that can be shown in the following. Uh, for the initial sub range. Let the energy oops, sorry, of K is equal C times epsilon to the power two third K to the power minus five third. Okay, if we can show that, the inertial subrange, essentially what you have here is a curve over here, it's almost linear. 
that's minus 5 that. So here you have a range, the NFS sub range, that goes uh, on the log log scale linear with, uh, with minus 5 third. <coughs> that is a, a, essentially a measure to determine whether or not you are in equilibrium. So for example, you use a hot wire to measure the frequency spectrum in the flow. And uh, you're going to have, have to have a look um, at the energy spectrum. And if the energy spectrum, you're plotting it, and you have here something like a um, uh, decreasing of the energy towards the smaller scales with minus 5 third, then you know that you are uh, in um, equilibrium with that. So essentially, so epsilon, the dissipation range, is equal the production rate at uh, L0, is equal to the energy transfer from the larger scales. So with that, the energy spectrum decreases. Constant with minus five feet. <coughs> okay. Ah, so. Again, energy spectrum is something that uh, you're going to find quite uh, frequently when you're studying uh, turbulent flows. Um, for example, when you do measurements, uh, you're going to have a look at the energy spectrum. You can then identify where you have uh, well, the energy. You can determine then, for example, if there are predominant frequencies in the energy containing range. Uh, but it also can tell you wh whether or not your flow uh, is uh, in, a, uh, in a equilibrium. So, for example, in the initial stages of a mixing layer, you would not expect it to be in, in an equilibrium because of well, they're just producing the, the, the large-scale vortices. And uh, but uh, as soon as these vortices are starting, uh, the large-scale structures are going to be destroyed. Then this inertial subrange is going to fill up. The dissipation range is going to fill up until you have something like an equilibrium. Yeah. All right. So, um, so with that, uh, I have given you some tools and some uh, measurements or some ways to analyze now the, the, the smaller scales of turbulence. So you have, uh, for example, the, the uh, common goal scales that are limiting your, your spectrum on the, on the upper end. So you should know something what, what, are, well, what is the importance of the common goal scales and that the dissipation is taking place only on the smaller scales. That you have something like an inertial subrange in between the larger scales and the dissipation range. And that the uh, uh, well, the task or the the, the, the role of the inertial subrange is essentially to uh, take the energy from the larger scales, break them up into smaller ones, and just pass on this energy to the dissipation range. So there's not much going on on dissipation in the in the inertial subrange itself. All right. Uh, with that, um, I thank you very much, and uh, that concludes our this uh, part of the. Uh, the